Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Charmaine Ludlow, and on behalf of Interim Dean Valdez and the entire Macaulay community, I would like to welcome you to our At Macaulay Entrepreneur Series featuring Jason Cohen, Class of 2007, Queens Campus. Macaulay Honors College is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and we're happy that we can curate programming that showcase our alumni and what they are accomplishing in the world and in their community. We would also like to connect them to our current students who are the next generation of entrepreneurs. Right now, I would like to introduce our guest. Jason Cohen is the CEO and co-founder of My Bundle TV. Prior to starting My Bundle TV, Jason was a portfolio manager at Buckingham Capital Management, where he researched and invested in the media telecom sector with a special focus on how streaming TV was disrupting the traditional ecosystem. With all the new choices and challenges, Jason started My Bundle TV to help simplify streaming for consumers, streaming services, and broadband providers. Moderating the conversation tonight is Johnny Sullivan, a senior at our Queens campus. Johnny is the editor in chief of the Night News, Queens College's student run newspaper. He previously served the Night News as its managing editor. He is majoring in journalism with minors in Italian and physics and currently working on his senior thesis in which he explores and develops an ideal method for profiling of public figures. He was recently, up before this programming, um, was accepted to a remote editorial internship with Bands in Town, a music marketing firm based in San Diego. I would like to welcome them both on right now to at Macaulay Entrepreneurs. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so I guess without further ado, we'll get started with the line of questioning. So first, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about your particular experiences, and then maybe we can branch out and, you know, I'll, I'll pick your brain um, for your opinions on the, the world of entrepreneurship at large. So um, I'll start off by asking about your experiences as a Macaulay student. And we were talking about this not too long ago, but back when you went, it was the, I believe it was the CUNY Honors College. Um, like and there back, were quite back, a few. Back, back when I went. Yeah, keep going. Go, keep going. <laughs> um, and I, I was wondering, um, you know, what was this? scope of the program at that point? What did it look like? What were its goals? What, what was different? Yeah, sure. So I think, so first, you know, thanks, Johnny. This is hopefully have some fun. And, you know, at the end, they open up for some questions and, you know, anything, anything kind of goes here. Um, yeah. So it was, like you said, some time ago, I guess it was, we were talking 15 years ago, I graduated from college, which doesn't feel that long, but it actually, I guess it actually is 2007. But when I applied, to be honest, it was it was CUNY honors. It was I think it was either the second year we were the second freshman class or the or the third freshman class maybe, and there was really like what is what is this right? Cool, you're gonna it's a free school and they're gonna throw some money at you and um, a free Apple laptop. Um, you know I you know, I was gonna go to Queens anyways probably, so this was a great you know opportunity. But I think what you know that was that was the heading in right. So at the time. Part of it was a bet on um, not even not applying to other schools, saying like, "Hey, this this seems like this could be a really cool program," and I and I promise you, it was 10, 15 years from now, maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, is there going to be equity to this? Right? Will I be able to look back and kind of be like, "Cool, I didn't just go to Queens," and like that Macaulay sort of was able to do, and and from following what the what the team at Macaulay is able to do over the last few years last 10 years, it definitely seems like it was a good bet. I mean, uh, you know, we'll probably get to it later. Uh, my, my college doesn't really come up that often at this point in, in life, right? But looking and following the progress, it's been cool. And so I would say the actual experience, right, those first four semesters, and I'm sure similar now, there was, um, you know, special classes that we had to take, 
frankly, classes I never would have picked myself, right? Like uh, arts in New York City was not something I would have ever done. But I think that, you know, I think we had to read The Power Broker, right? By, uh, which is about, you know, uh, Moses. And it's like, that was one of the, probably the most impactful, just even informational books kind of you've ever read about learning about New York. I don't know if they still make people read it, but it was a great book, a big book, but a great book, right? Um, and so I think that that, that just... <laughs> the way they brought together the campuses, I think there was a little bit of experimenting. Sure, like, you know, this is all new, new programming, but it was cool to meet kind of fellow, not just the Queens CUNY Honors kids, but uh, the other, I think at the time, it was six other campuses uh, and coming together all the time. So it was a, uh, uh, you know, I my understanding is maybe uh, there were some more perks back then that might not have followed through all the way through today. But, you know, I think that really, really helped. It was a lot easier to get in. That'd be the last thing I say. I'm pretty confident that we looked at when my class entered, what the average SAT scores and grade needed to be. You know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that has only increased over time. So I guess I'm happy about that. You know, um, now, you know, Macaulay Honors College is definitely an established entity on the Queens College campus. But to hear you and to hear, you know, other um, graduates from around your time when the program was in its infancy, I am wondering, um, it, it, to hear them talk about it, it almost sounds like at the time it was like Queens College Plus, you know, or like Queens College with DLC. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, if that affected, you know, um, what drew you to it versus what might have drawn me to to applying for Macaulay now? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm sure it was, right? For me, I think if I remember the application process, it was you had to apply to this CUNY Honors entity, but there was Queens and then there was Queens Honors and then there was this CUNY Honors. And I think, you know, for three years, it was hard for me to explain to my parents. You know, they were happy there was no bill, right? There's a, a, a nice relief. But the the idea of, right, anybody really being excited, frankly, like nobody was necessarily excited to apply and go to CUNY honors. Um, I don't think, I think over the years, my understanding is, and, and you know, it's a credit to um, those running the program is, you know, or they're just really good marketers, right? It's, oh, why go to this other good school when you can stay here and go to our really good program and not go into insane amount of debt, right? I mean, I, I'll again, certainly share, we think, Anything the last 10, 15 years have taught us is like debt is a terrible thing if you're not going to go do something with it. And so maybe that's one thing I, I do remember um, in my class and in the programming, it was kids who, you know, if you went to this program and you weren't saddled with that student debt, you didn't have to become, let's say, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer or go into finance, right? They were people that were very, it was, you know, my, I didn't have those passions, but pursuing their passions in the arts, right? And you could do that without debt, right? And I'm willing to bet, you know, there's a whole bunch of probably on calls like this, other alumni doing kind of very cool things that they wouldn't have been able to probably if they didn't have that program. And again, I assume that only over time gets better and better as more people apply and um, to the program as well. Yeah, something that um, fascinates me about your journey in particular is that even among Macaulay students who are educated in a program that kind of preaches this this ideal of holistic education where you get you know your arts in you get your sciences in you get your um sociological studies in every everything like that even among those students your your journey seems to me to be particularly full of twists and turns and the first one i want to look at is um your your jump from a major in poli sci to the to a hedge fund so i'm wondering you know how do you make that jump um what was the was the was there any sort of like stigma associated with that at the time cuz now it's it's kind of more accepted that you can sort of your undergrad is one thing and then you can branch off. Has that always been the case or was it more confined? Oh, just to be clear, are you asking, was it a stigma that I was working at a hedge fund or are you asking no, 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 my, like, like, my like, poli sci like, was my it, poli sci degree? Maybe stigma, stigma wasn't the best word. Yeah, no, was I, it, was I'm, it, I'm just messing with you. Were I'm people messing. kind of like, yeah, 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 raise, yeah, I hear did you. it raise any eyebrows or? 
No, I think I think what was interesting, yeah, just just getting there. But I think what was interesting for me, right, the poli side, I was really interested in politics. I was I interned on political campaigns throughout school. My uh, my study abroad, as some of my friends were going to like you know Europe or London or the Galapagos Islands, I went to Washington D.C. and interned for the semester, right, at the uh, NRCC, I think it was, um, and it was great. And and I'll be honest, like the poli sci major taught me something that I think is very important is is politics, right doesn't mean the 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 leaders of our country and Congress and Senate, like you're in an office, you're in a family. It's all politics, right? Political sciences, you know, can also be applied to any two human interactions. And I and I will definitely say that that those studies and the books that I read and the the stuff that I learned in poli sci, I would say certainly helped me uh, in my career. Right. So there's I guess you could call that the soft touch. But really what it was was I was a poli sci major. I was thinking about going to law school. I took the LSATs even. And then when I was getting ready to apply to law school, um, somebody I knew was in compliance at this hedge fund. And I went in to talk to him and we were talking about law and did I really want to do it? And he said, why don't you intern for me for the summer? Uh, this was you know, after actually senior year. Intern for me for the summer, see how you like it. I started, I think, right before graduation and it was miserable, right? I, no, he's not listening, but I hated it, like doing compliance. And I knew that wasn't for me, but I was always into the stock market and kind of got hooked. And so um, while that internship was going on, a spot you know, opened up in operations. And this is the part of all these um, conversations that are luck plays a big, important role in everybody's journey. Right. No one is perfect. No one is the is a genius that you need a little bit of luck. Right. And my break came from like, what are the chances that somebody quit their operations job um, while I was there for the summer intern? And I was like, cool, I'll do that. Right. Seems, you know, not the most. It wasn't what I didn't want to grow up and be an operations guy. But I was like, here's a job paid decently. Um, and it was around something I was really interested in. And so I jumped into that operations job and I would say, the I think there's poli sci, and I think back at the time I wasn't a CUNY honors kid. Like they didn't know what that was. I was a Queens College kid, so I would say there was definitely fairly a more of a quote unquote stigma on like what was that, and that's also a chip on my shoulder that I'm sure that most of Macaulay, even as it's as it's grown, I think there's something about the CUNY Macaulay program where it's that's part of part of who we are, right? Like those Harvard, Yale, Princeton kids, like cool, they you know they did that they. But at the end of the day, it's, are you going to work hard, right? Work ethic was definitely something um, that I did not have in high school whatsoever, right? So I, you know, tried to just float through however I could. I did well on the SATs, decently on the SATs, got into the program. But once I started working, I said, you know what? This is something I want to do. And I worked. I lived in Queens, commuted to the city. Um, you know, that wasn't so much fun, right? But it was something early in the morning at my desk at 6.45, 7 a.m., a bus to the subway, like that old story. And then really, once I got there, I realized I didn't want to do operations. And I said, I want to do research. So how do you do research? So I just grabbed it by the horns and said, I'm going to do the CFA. So I was a poli sci major and I was a BALA, was the Queens program, a business minor. I didn't think, I think I took accounting 101, maybe 102, right? No finance classes, no anything. It was purely though the CFA, which for those not familiar, it's a three-year program. They give the test, let's say every June, once a year, it has like a 30% pass rate each level. And it's a really good, um, it's the equivalent of business school if you wanna pick stocks. That's the best way to, to describe it. It's, it's more valuable than business school. So I was able to teach myself over the ensuing three years, the industry, the business, all while at Buckingham, the name of the hedge fund was Buckingham, going from um, operations, slowly doing more research and not letting, and this is, I guess, first thing I would say to anybody on the call, don't wait for somebody to give you something, right? Like there's there's rope hanging around at every job, every career, every part of life. And I, if I saw rope, I just grabbed it. And so I went into a corner office, one of the portfolio managers and pitched Apple stock. And that worked out well, right? And so that pitch, he didn't ask me for it, but I pitched him that. And, you know, we would keep talking about it. And eventually, I think it was like eight months later, that portfolio manager walked into the operation, my boss's office and said, what the heck's Jason still doing here in operations? I want him on research. And then as I did the CFA, right? Something I was able to control myself that really crystallized it. And so that was 2011 when I was able to switch to research. Then it didn't matter where I went to school, didn't matter um, what I studied, right? Cause it's really, and I'm a big believer in this, it's on the job learning, right? 
but applying my poli sci soft learning certainly right to that as well. So obviously if your story doesn't end at Buckingham. Um, I'm wondering, and I, I run the risk of using kind of a hackneyed phrase here, but do you, did you climb the corporate ladder? Did you, did you go about doing that intending to stick around or had you always had your sights set on branching off and going solo? Yeah, so I would say the the fun Buckingham it would be, I guess, more like a corporate step stool than a ladder, just in the sense it was a very small place. Uh, so, you know, it was a very flat structure. There was the owner, chief investment officer, portfolio manager, and me, right? That was the team that was picking stocks. And so uh, what actually happened, I never had this grand vision. I was doing it. I was like, I could do this forever, right? I'm going to keep picking stocks forever. My portfolio manager in 2012 told me, by the way, I'm leaving, retiring. I thought the world was ending. Like, what am I going to do? I've only been doing this for six months full of time. Like, what happens next? And he said, correctly, this is the best thing that's ever going to happen for you, right? There's rope over there. Keep pulling it. And either you hang yourself with it or you pull yourself up, right? And that really was what my time at the fund was. So much so, to your point, I'm obviously not at Buckingham anymore. We'll get into that in a second. But I never had any aspirations, any intention of doing anything in my life other than picking stocks. Like I loved it. So then how, at, at what point did the thought begin to creep into your head that maybe it was time to change gears? You know? Um... Yeah. So I would say, I would say that there wasn't any, um, what made it, I guess, uh, easy decision. We'll go through some of the, the factors, but I did not want to leave the hedge fund world, but I was covering multiple industries, airlines, housing, oil and gas, basically everything except for financials and, and, and healthcare. But I spent a lot of time on media and telecom. And in investing long and short, right, where hedge funds were able to bet against companies, we were able to bet against companies that we thought were in industries that were declining and, and investing in companies that we thought were going to make money. Through that process over the years, we had a big thesis. Legacy TV was dying. Right, The legacy TV ecosystem was dead. The internet was going to change it like it changed online travel, like it changed, changed retail. And we were betting accordingly. Fast forward to like 2017 and started to see like it was happening. I was right. Um, but there were some bottlenecks forming. Right, and, and just not to get into too much of the details, but the biggest bottleneck is like it's confusing. It's complicated for the consumers and for the industry participants. And so I started to have this idea like, hey, is there an opportunity? Like, why isn't there somebody who did X? Really, that's maybe the best way to say it. Is why isn't somebody building the kayak or the trip advisor for streaming? And six months would go by and it would get more complicated. And I felt better about our over underlying thesis. And I said, why isn't anybody doing this? To the point where I said, hey, you know what? Forget about that. Like, why don't I do it? Right? Why don't I do it? And so, you know, I didn't quit my job the next day and started up, there was a time where we, you know, with the buy-in from our, from my bosses, right, from the firm, they actually invested um, as part of those first investors. But there was an idea of like, this is what's missing. Let's do this. And once I kind of wrapped my head around, like this could work, I said, I can't believe it, but you know, at least for now, done are the days of stock picking. And as I call it, let's, let's go join the real world. That's uh, that's how I kind of talk about it now. So it, 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 I'm sure it was a, a, like a momentous decision for you. Um, and I'm sure that you didn't do it imprudently. There must have been some sort of like nest egg that you kept to the side as a contingency. So I'm wondering, how did you gauge your stability? And at what point did you know that this was something that you could either safely do or something that you could do confidently enough that you could kind of throw caution to the wind? Yeah. So uh, for people like, so it's, it's funny because I'm going to, I'm going to go with a, what, what, I don't even know if you kids say it anymore, but there's a, there's a YOLO uh, moment here. Right. And, and this is, I'm not oh, a, you you reaching know, a little back for that one. Okay. got it. <laughs> um, I don't know what the new word for that is, but the answer there is, and that's not necessarily the way I live my whole life, but there really was a, you know, what, what made me feel like I was the right guy. So it wasn't just, there was an idea. Cool. Um, it was that along the investing, I felt that I was a, had a unique view from 30,000 feet up of the different players in the space, that there weren't a lot of people 
like me, right? I found, again, I covered airlines. I didn't decide I want to go start a, an airline, right? I wasn't, I spent who knows how many, you know, phone calls and hours with home builders and building products companies. I wasn't about to go start a home builder. What happened in this space was that I had a unique view of where all the pieces were heading. And so I said, like, this is my job. This is my calling. Now, I was married, or I am married still, but I was married at the time, I guess, for three, four years. I had a two-year-old, right? So I had a little kid. And I would say that, thankfully, I was coming from the hedge fund world where I did have a little nest egg, where I was able to afford without sacrificing for my family um, to you know, make no money, right? Hence, the, that's the startup kind of life here, right? For a certain amount of time, um, I had to get their buy-in. Right. But I wasn't a 25 year old who was going to be able to live by myself on a futon in some, you know, $600 a month rental eating ramen noodles. Right. I couldn't do that. Right. Um, so I was able to both be uniquely positioned, I think, from an informational basis, right, from not from a skills basis. I never built anything in my life. Right. I was a hedge fund guy pushing papers around. Um, doing research, doing analysis and buying and selling, but not actually building things or managing people. Uh, but I was also, again, fortunate to be in a position where I was able to easily make that decision. Now, back to my YOLO comment is just like, look, we're, this is not the, my bundle is a publicly traded company and taking a victory lap, right? Like I'm, we're in the trenches right now. Thankfully, things are going awesome, but it is way too early you know, to have the mission accomplished flag and say like, I made the right, this, we could have a, a call three years from now and be like, man, Jason, that was a bad call, right? You should have stuck to the hedge fund world. So it's kind of cool, but I can say that and confidently love every minute of what I'm, there's no regrets, not a second of like looking back and being like, hey, I should have stayed, I should have stayed. Oh my God, Charmaine had to explain that one, really? That's that's my first really dating <laughs> myself there. Um, so anyways, that is, uh, that is, the um that is kind of how how and why I was able to kind of to make that make that change. Do you feel like um you got into it at at, at the right time? Do do you feel like that that like if, if you had if you had looked at the if you were making the jump today, do you think it would have been more difficult? And not just in the sense that you know the entire market is different, but like, do you think that, that you, you were, um, fortunate or I don't want to say fortunate. Cause I think that takes away from your accomplishment, but do you feel like it, it, it was good that you caught that when you did that, this well, particular yeah. gap yeah. in the market? So I'll say that there's nothing wrong with fortunate, right? I mean, there are guys who had similar ideas to what I did eight years ago, right? They're no longer here. Um, obviously if, so I, I hope that if somebody has this idea eight years from now, it will be way too late for them. But there's no question ideas now. Now I say that I, if, if I didn't feel like now was the right time, then I wouldn't have taken the risk, right? It's a big risk. Starting your own company, there's a massive risk there, right? I went to all my friends and family and I like our first investors were everybody I, my entire life, right? And the pitch was simple. The pitch was this massive revolution, the streaming revolution that I call it was happening. Um, I think I know what's happening better than 95% of Wall Street or industry participants that are like that. If there's any kind of haughtiness to it, it's me being able to make that statement. I felt that meeting after meeting, year after year in the hedge fund world, analyzing the businesses. But I said to all of them, like, I do not, I cannot give you a business plan right now that's going to show here's how we're going to make all our money five years from now. It was there's this massive change happening. I know what's happening better than other people. We're going to figure this out. Don't invest a penny more than you are going to be totally cool with losing it all. Right. And I, and that was to me as again, for anybody who's thinking about doing this, I think it's very important to be on the same page as your investors, because what I've seen as an investor and also as a, as an entrepreneur now, the worst thing that could happen ever is misaligned um, understandings of an undertaking. So whether that's investors or partners, right? I don't go with a you know a pile of crap when I'm pitching a broadband provider on our service. Like this is exactly what we do. Here's what you're going to get out of it. Here's what you won't. And and it's just important if people understand that people are on the same page. You know, it's kind of it's not buyer beware. It's like going into it. So I think that um, I think from a timing perspective, it was perfect timing on what was happening to the industry. Obviously, I didn't know COVID was about to happen, right? So I am very happy that I didn't start a travel startup, right, in uh, 
November of 2019, right, was when I officially left the hedge fund and, and switched over to this. Um, I also, though, then I moved down to Florida, and that was probably the best thing, the best trade that ever happened was moving from Manhattan to Florida right before COVID hit. Um, but what did COVID, excuse me, what did COVID do? Obviously, it helped with the streaming, but uh, and I, maybe I'll just go very quickly. What do we do as mybundle.tv? Uh, we started, hey, it's confusing, helping people cut the cord, right? People, 70 million households still have cable satellite TV. We help them switch over to live TV streaming services. 45 million households are just cord cutters or cord nevers. We help them find new streaming services, find content across their streaming services with the, the real North Star is making streaming simpler. Every single person I speak to, everyone you know, has some pain point like, man, this is annoying. All these services, where do I find TV shows? Where do I find movies? How do I do it all? So we're focused on, on solving that. But one of the things um, that we didn't realize going in, back to this, like what I told those initial investors, was it's not just consumers wanted to cut the cord, it's cable providers want to get out of the cable business. And so our biggest focus today wasn't even a thought back in 2019 when we started it, which is we now partner with over 70 broadband and cable providers using our tools. So what does it have to do with COVID, right? Number one, we're not going to get into like the why too much they're doing that. But because of COVID, it wasn't so much the streaming, it was the ability to hop on a Zoom call like this and pitch that first partner, that second partner, that third partner, the 70th partner. Before COVID, I would have had to get on an airplane or somebody would have had to get on an airplane probably multiple times to convince these partners, right, to use the service and here's why. And so I think what one of the positive impacts of COVID, right, not to be crass, was that business is just more efficient. And I think that's part of why we're seeing the startup explosion everywhere is people are like a 30 minute call on Zoom versus a plane ride and back kills three days. Like things are just more efficient. So um, I, you, you meant use the word fortunate. I, I will no question say that should this work out, COVID was probably the biggest reason that this will have worked out and that in a world without COVID, we would not be where we are today. I'm not going to ask you to divulge any trade secrets here, but um, I'm wondering, ha have, have there been talks among your staff um, to plan for what happens when um, the pandemic dies down and people start spending less time at home and, you know, what happens to the, as the demand fluctuates accordingly what's going to happen with the the market and how you account for that uh you mean like so specifically like the streaming market streaming tv yeah 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 streaming so, so it happens to yeah. be it happens to be right it's it, it will be the best thing that happens as long as i don't have to go back on airplanes to go do my b2b business to business sales it will be the best thing that happens right why um if you think about Right. We, what do we do? What's our number one kind of function is helping people get rid of cable and switch to a skinnier bundle, switch to another streaming service. People have been stuck at home for two years. They got tons of stimulus checks. So like we just had a mat, like the world shut down and there was like a three minute recession. Right. So people were, st were at home getting paid effectively to stay home. The last thing you were going to do is cancel cable. Right. So we actually think that there's this pent up not demand, but this pent up supply almost of cord cutters that when they finally are now like, hey, we're back to whatever new normal looks like, what the heck am I paying for cable for? It's only gotten more expensive since I've been there. So our business isn't dependent on how many minutes you're sitting at home watching TV, right? It's that's not, that's, there's not a direct correlation to specifically that. It's, are, do you need more broadband, right? Like our broadband partners, I just, this, these last two days, I was at a conference called Metro Connect down in Miami. Billions and billions and billions of dollars. The government's about to spend $42 billion over the next five years, bringing broadband to the country, the places in the country that either have nothing or have no competition. These are my partners. So I like that, the macro backdrop literally couldn't be any better. My, my biggest kind of quote unquote challenge is we've got to go hire people and we've got, 14 roles that we're about to go kind of so we'll maybe get to the end if anybody's looking for a job we might we might ask for your resume but the that is something that if i think about like if the what keeps me up at night it's like man how are we going to grow to do all the things we want to do fast enough 
as opposed to what is a perfectly logical question, by the way, people getting out, who's going to be streaming that churn cancel a streaming service, sign up for another one, sign up for, you know, that's, that's good for us. That's, that's what we want to happen. So on a related note, the impression I get when I hear you and other entrepreneurs talk about what they do and what they have done is that when you are, when you are a self-starter, the most important assets that you can have at your disposal are adaptability and spontaneity. Is that something with which you would agree? Um, as, as you're saying, as a, as a specifically as an entrepreneur, um, I yeah. would say, yeah, you have to have like almost like probably a little uh, ADD or functional ADD, right? Like, so I wouldn't have said that before the hedge fund, but like if I was, what was, what was my day like at the hedge fund? I had four big computer screens. It was like billions without the, you know, fun and, and excitement, right? I'm at my screen. I've got flashing lights and stocks going up, stocks going down. I would go to a conference and I'd have to, I'd meet with an airline, then a home builder, then a, then a oil and gas company. So your brain literally has to be able to do multiple things at once or very quickly at least shift, right? I would say maybe the way to answer that as an entrepreneur, you need to be able to do many things at once and very easily without being like distracted or I'm answering this email. Now I'm giving this instruction. Now I have a call with a broadband provider. Now I have a call with a streaming service. Now I'm dealing with a, a service provider. Then my website goes down. Okay, tech team, let's figure this out. So I think that a little bit of cool under pressure, right? Like not easily, uh, my daughter Carter is pretty much the only person in the world that can get me upset, right? Like other than that, I'm pretty, pretty even keel. Um, and so there's, um, there's something about that. I think that you hit on something like you, I think you need to be, to be able to be calm, um, and do it. I will say, um, this is my first time doing it. My understanding is it gets a lot easier the second and third and fourth time. Right. So there's a thing in VC world, like people, sometimes they just, if they know there's a second or third time founder, here's some money, right. First time founders have a lot higher of a hill to climb which there, there's something rational about that, right? If you built a company and successfully sold it, everything that I've spent the last two years learning, they already know, right? And so there's an element there of um, needing to be able to do many things at once, certainly uh, very important. Well, I imagine it's because you don't want to give investors a reason to feel like they're taking a gamble on you. You, you, I guess you want to bring a track record to any sort of pitch. Um, so they know that they're, that they have more of a blue chip, um, prospect on their hands to use a sports metaphor. Yeah, no, listen, listen, I, back to where we started the conversation, right? If you went, if you went to Harvard or you went to Princeton, right? And you're on a stack of resumes, right? The person who's looking at the job, like, cool. Well, that guy went to Princeton, that girl went to Harvard. I know what that means. I'm going to put that towards the front of the stack, right? So what I did, so the similar to the Queens thing, right? You got to work hard, grab that rope and kind of go do the CFA. So what did I do? I gobbled up every book I could find. I'm a big reader. Um, so about history and I, history rhymes, if not repeats itself. And so you just read, 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 read about other founders story, read about venture capital books, read about lean startup, read dozens of books through this process and through the B2B sales. I wasn't a sales guy. I am now like our sales guy. We're our lead salesperson pitching broadband providers on why they should use our services. You either learn that through experience, you learn it through books, or you learn it through both. And so I'm a big fan of reading is the only way right? Reading and surrounding yourself with other people who've done it, whether it's advisors, whether it's mentors, right? Whether it's hiring people that are smarter than you, right? That's my, that's my biggest goal is to hire people that are smarter than me, right? They might not know the industry and the ins and outs is better, but they're smarter and they're better at things than I am. And so very much pulling that all together, I think is, is the only way to bend that learning curve. And that's what I, you know, to me, life is about bending that learning curve and just, you know, doing things faster than you otherwise could. So um, I guess now I'll, I'll zoom out and, and sort of for these next few questions, I'll ask you more about the, the general business of entrepreneurship than with your specific experience. Although obviously you're going to bring your experience to answer these questions. Um, do, you, do, you, do you find that the work 
life balance dynamics sort of changes when you're a self starter and you're setting your own pace versus when you're employed? Yeah, I, th I think this, this would be else. this would be the warning section of the of the chat would be like, <laughs> if you are thinking about starting your own thing, taking other people's money, right, as taking investors on and, and doing that, there is no work life balance, right? It's, it's work. Um, and, and I'll say like, there's obviously some some balance there. And for me, it's right, it's, it's work, and then it's family. And thankfully, I'm someone who like, when people say they love their work, there's nothing, if I have an hour of time, uh, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than working. Like it doesn't feel like work. So there's something element here of like, there's no balance per se. It's work or family time, but it's a lot of work. Um, it's I, I, you know, wake up, do take care of my kids, help them get to school, work. They come home, do a little dinner, back to work from seven to 11, right? So it, it's work, work, work. But again, it doesn't feel like work. I moved, so like I moved down from New York to Florida as I played golf in New York, I've played one and a half rounds of golf here in the last two years down in Florida, right? Why? Because I really can't justify spending five, six hours out there. And so there's an element there of if you're going to be an entrepreneur, right? And you're going to own this company and you're going to manage people and you're going to have other shareholders, you need to be all in. There's no half-assing entrepreneurship. Um, there's no, there's no, don't think that there's any kind of balance. That, there'll be time for golf. Right, that's my attitude. There'll be time for golf eventually. Now, I'll just I'll 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 caveat that with that's being the the owner. That's being the founder, right? What I think is really interesting is the people who work for us have an entrepreneurial spirit, right? One of our our, our I call him our MVP, right? He was at he was a paralegal and he was trying to figure out what to do and he realized he wanted out of legal and he came and he started working for us. Um, and it, he's been awesome, right? And, and it's that entrepreneurial, like he didn't want to be in corporate America, right? He never, he didn't get sucked in for too long. It's a different life, right? I would think that this is, this is a, a better life in the sense of we work with big companies all the time. And it seems like a pretty awful way to do things. It's just, is we talk about politics. There's politics, there's power levels, your boss, my boss, lawyers get in the way. At a startup, everyone, you join a startup and it's, there's, there's a little element of much more work-life balance comes into, how much are you willing to throw in there? Do you want to work from seven in the morning to 11 at night? Do you want to work from nine to five, right? All about having that understanding of how much do you want to get out of it? And I think that what becomes very cool about a startup, any startup world, is there's equity, right? So when somebody comes and works for us and they, they're, they're working for three months, six months, nine months, and they're good. Well, there's equity involved. Now they become an owner in the company, right? And that means something special. I don't know that you're getting that, that feeling from a big company. Um, and the, frankly, the biggest change that's happened since it, in 2007, there weren't startups. There was startups in San Francisco. Like that was it, right? It wasn't, there wasn't a startup scene. I almost feel like kids coming out of, you know, if you're coming out of school right now, you probably are thinking maybe even more. Like, why would I go work in finance? I, I think I'm like Goldman's having to pay like twice as much to get people to go work there. Because, you know, it's a lot more exciting to go build something, right? Every day we wake up, we do something. If our team of seven, 15 people wasn't doing it, it wouldn't get done, right? I think that that's, I think, I think you want a certain type of people, if you're entrepreneurial, probably if you're on this call, you want to feel like you're making a difference, right? You want to feel like you're, you're doing something that has a direct result and you get that in that early stage startup world. So, uh, I mean, I would, I would certainly say that would be an advice. I mean, it's just like, it's fun. I would say that it's fun. You know, Jason, I, I have more than half of the questions I wanted to ask still on the sheet, but I want to give the, um, the people in the audience time to, to, um, ask their own questions. So I'll try and keep a lid on mine. Um, but I, but I did just want to ask a couple more, um, so with, because the tech boom really took off, I would say not too long after you left college, do you think going to college now, your approach would have been different? Do you think maybe you would have majored in something different, like maybe something more tech related right out of the gate or how, how would you have navigated that differently? That's a good question. I mean, like, I feel like the, there is a easy, an easier path to success right now is if you're willing to learn how to code 
there's a job for you that probably pays better than most jobs, right? That didn't exist. It wasn't like, oh, take some coding classes, learn it. There is now like this institutional, not just in college, I'm sure in college also, there are programs specifically, there's always computer science, but now it's, you could remake yourself as a coder. I think that that, I don't think I would have done that, but that is something that is definitely out there because there's this demand for it. So it's a demand pull. Um, it's a really, I've never thought about it, right? What would be, what would I do differently today if I was graduating college? Um, I, I would have to think that it's this startup, you know, I guess I, Miami is taking off as a, as a, I, mean, I'm, I live in Fort Lauderdale, but I'd move to Miami. That's for sure. I, I, I couldn't be more, it's me and the mayor of Miami are the two most bullish people about this, this area. Um, and, and it's 75 degrees outside. So that's a big part about it, but it's really the culture, right? It's the culture of success. It's the culture of, and I think that that's, I, I'll, I'll tie it to back to this comp, compass, uh, concept of what you want to be. You want to be in a place that's growing, right? Where there's energy and people want to succeed, right? Not like, oh, let's hold this person back, whether it's in a business or in an environment and you want to surround yourselves with that growth. And I think I'd get out of school and be like, what's growing? There's no such thing as a tech sector anymore, right? There's just technology. Every industry is being changed by technology. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things that was like a light bulb moment for me, the reason why there's so much growth and there's so much opportunity out there is that if I was starting the business today, my bundle 10 years ago, we probably would have had to hire 90 people to what we're now doing the work of 14 with, because there are so many other startups and other technology companies building all the layers of the tech stack to allow you to sort of no, you could build companies no code at this point, because there's like 35 no code companies. And so I think that, and I don't know, I'm actually curious to hear if there's anybody in the audience, but like, I would assume that the number one job coming out of college, if you're entrepreneurial, would be like, how do I go find a tech startup, right? Or a small growing tech company to go work at, right? I, I, I gotta assume that's sort of the top of the list. What, what you just said is kind of um, a form of what we in the journalistic field would call a call to action. So I think <laughs> that this is probably a good place to um, close this portion of the panel. Um, so Charmaine, I guess we'll turn it over to audience questions. Yes, there's actually one um, that I sent to you from Max Z. So Jason, he was asking, do, do streaming services or cable providers ever reach out to you about my bundle? And have they confused you for an agitator? Ad, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> aggregator. That's yeah, what we it's what we it's what we do, but I still have a hard time saying it. So don't worry, okay. <laughs> and try to look for ways to optimize their relevance in your recommendations. Cool, so breaking that question out, thanks Max, a couple of ways. So yes, and that's the best thing, right? Because uh, back to what do we do, we take our tools, right? Number one tool is answer a few questions, pick the channels you need, and we tell you which of the live TV streaming services you need. So YouTube TV, Hulu Live, Sling, Fubo, Philo. Um, it's a like for like, and so, the essence, I think, of the second part of your question is, well, how if somebody pays you a big commission, you just recommend them? The answer is, as we're building a business, the only the consumer always comes first. So in a recommendation tool where we're saying we're making a personalized recommendation tool, a recommendation to you, the consumer, we never let anything impact it other than is this the best service for that person? Okay, so that's number one. Happens to be cable providers, right? You said, do they reach out? So uh, most of us, if we grew up in New York, either had Optimum, maybe RCN, Spectrum, right, which was Time Warner Cable. There's 3,000 internet providers across the country, okay? And, and it's big guys and it's little guys and it's utilities and it's rural telephone companies. So we're working with all of them. And the best part about where we're at right now is we have cable and broadband providers reaching out to us. Why is that good? Because it makes my sales job a lot easier when somebody reaches out to us, right? Um, but we also have those streaming services and, and that second part, have you, like, we are an aggregator. So we do a lot of, a, a little bit of everything, right? Our North star is what we're simplifying streaming. What are we doing? We're helping you find where you can, where you can cut the cord. That's our find my bundle tool. Then for all cord cutters or anybody who has streaming services, I know a TV show or movie. I want to figure out where to watch it. 
You could search for it on my bundle. Uh, I have these streaming services. I sit on my couch or bed and I spend 10 minutes scrolling through Netflix and then 15 minutes scrolling through Hulu to find something to watch. We bring all that content into one place and allow you to basically scan through that on your phone, on your computer, on your tablet um, to build a watch list. Ultimately, what's the third problem is there are all these streaming services and there's 300 streaming services out there, right? And I might sign up for one, I forget about it. And I signed up for another here with this credit card. And then I signed up on my Fire TV. And so, right, what we're really doing, we're, and we've built this already, is, is aggregating streaming services and allowing consumers to buy their streaming services through my bundle so that you can actually consolidate your streaming bill right in one place, easily be able to see how much you're paying for those streaming services, easily be able to cancel them, right? But also, specifically finding new shows and movies, and we'll be able to make recommendations across your streaming services based on you, right? Netflix is never gonna tell you what you're gonna like to watch on Amazon or Disney. Disney's never gonna help you find something on Showtime. But when we know all your streaming services, right? And we know what's on your watch list and stuff like that, um, there's an opportunity there to continuously make better recommendations. Um, I see another question here. How can you place your bid to be a part of that 40? Do you want to know, do you want to start? Whoever asked that, do you want to start a broadband provider? Is that the question? Or, or what are we doing to, to help that along? Uh, I'll, let, I'll let that person follow up there. Oh, that's Char Charmaine, they're saying. Okay, so um, I would say that you need to do a lot of work to be one of the broadband providers who want the 42 billion. But what's really exciting, frankly, for, for me, right, is my bundle started, you know, entrepreneurially, not necessarily altruistically. Right? It was, we're going to help consumers figure this mess out, um, and we're going to make some money in the process. Right? But what's, what's been really cool, this partnership with these broadband providers has actually um, put closing the digital divide at the front and center of what we're doing. Right? So why? How do, I, how do I get to that? It's a math equation. Building a broadband network and bringing internet to people is a math equation. It costs me X dollars to dig a hole in the ground and lay fiber and connect homes to it. I will get Y percent of those homes to actually subscribe to me for internet and they're gonna pay me Z, okay? Those are the three pieces of the equation. It's fairly simple. Um, so what happens? I lay fiber, there's a Comcast or Spectrum and there's no internet anywhere. And those people have Dish or DirecTV. And I'm saying, I'm gonna go build a fiber network and 20% of people are gonna sign up, 30%, 40%. The math on, is it worth it to build that network changes the more people that decide to give up their slow internet, maybe their copper phone dial up. There's, there's uh, this is a shock to most of us, 20 to 30 to 40 million homes in the country who don't have high speed, they don't have access to high speed internet. It's 20 meg on a good clear day through their DSL. And so what we, what we allow people, what we allow our broadband partners to do is by allowing them to literally knock on doors and say, hey, we've got fiber internet, you could get a gig. And they say, what the heck am I gonna do with a gig? I've got my satellite you know, TV on the roof, my dish on the roof, and my email works. What else do I need, right? This is still a big portion of the country out there. And, and really what they're really asking is, is there a way for me to get my TV through streaming. I don't want it. I don't want Netflix. I don't need Netflix. How do I get HGTV? How do I get my local, you know, Fox news? And that's where our tool allows that agent, the website or the agent to basically say, Oh, great news. Did you know you can get everything you're used to watching on streaming? And they say, no, what is, what does that mean? And the tool then allows them to see, Oh, cool. I can get this save $140 a month versus their satellite bill and sign up for now having a gig internet, right? And what that does is back to that, that why, I think it was why, increases that penetration on a network. The more people that a broadband provider can bring onto a network, the more, the higher the revenue, obviously, the higher the return on that investment. And whether they're a for-profit or a non-for-profit, that allows them to grow faster. And what the $42 billion does is, the $42 billion is going to allow people to bring that fiber bends that cost curve. And it's gonna allow that provider to bring internet at a lower penetration rate than other before. Our answer of course is like great news, we're gonna help you grow that penetration rate even higher. 
and go make your dollars go even further. And so we very, we speak about it and I, I, I can look myself in the mirror or anybody in the eye and say like, we are, we are helping to close the digital divide um, by that. It's not all we're doing, but very clearly, like when we're partnering with these rural utility companies or rural broadband, like we are helping them solve a problem that they cannot do on their own. They'll never be able to do on their own. Um, and, and, you know, as a, as a human, right, as an American, right, the craziest thing is that everyone doesn't have access to broadband. And I think that's the most important thing of this infrastructure bill that just passed is everyone should have broadband. Every town across America should have access to fiber um, because kids growing up in those communities don't have high speed. Imagine not having high speed internet, right? Imagine not being able to, to do the research and, and there are a lot of smart kids across the country that just, they were unfortunate to grow up in places that don't have broadband. In my mind, that's unacceptable. unacceptable. And so politics is, you know, there's a reason the broadband bill was bipartisan because it's hard to say no, unless you work for Comcast or Spectrum, it's pretty hard to be like, this is a bad idea. And so it's, I think the next five years, again, you're going to see it's, it's going to be like when they built the highways and we feel like we're at the front row of rebuilding and building right, this broadband infrastructure in this country. Thank you, Jason. The next question I see is from Brianne. So she said, great to see you. And thanks so much for being here. You said it was too early to run your victory lap. What does the most aspirational success look like for my bundle? That's a good question. Um, the most aspirational. I think I think we think that there's a um, a, a multi billion dollar opportunity here that can be in the public markets. Um, when we look at the the space that we're playing in and the the broadband video advertising market is a three hundred billion dollar a year business. It's all going from traditional to streaming. We're in the third inning, and we're basically raising our hand and saying we're building the tools to allow this revolution to happen. Again, most of us are thinking of when I have conversations, like everybody's true, who the heck has cable anymore, right? 70 million households still have either satellite or traditional flip the channel TV, right? And that's shifting over to streaming, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or YouTube TV or Sling or Fubo or Philo, it's happening. And so if we, our, our mission, right, is, is frankly, what's the biggest risk to, to us is, are we going fast enough? Right. Like if I look back five, six, seven, eight years from now and we look back and say, why didn't this work? Why, why aren't I playing golf you know, every day in 2030? Um, it's because we didn't go fast enough. And I think that, you know, that's why I just like to share like this is one job. You're, you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to start a business. You're always fundraising. Right. You're always raising more money to go do more things. Um, and, and so that's this is the type of it's not a you know, if you wanted to start a T-shirt company, the world's always going to need T-shirts. If you could design them better, stitch them better, source them better, it doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years, like there's a t-shirt business. But if you're, if you're gonna start something that's a moment in time, which is what we feel like we're at right now, speed is our, or time is our biggest enemy. And so we're, you know, we actually just this week kicking off another round of fundraising. And this one's gonna be a bigger one where we've got a list of the next 14 people we wanna hire. We're about to, we're gonna put up a career page soon how, do am I, how am I going to find those people? Is it my network? Is it our other employees' network? Is it putting it on LinkedIn? Um, I would say if there's one piece of advice here, and your LinkedIn is by far the best B2B or marketing channel and network, right? So connect to people that you're interested in, like reach out, right? Maybe they don't answer, who cares? But some of them will, and some of them will have time. And I would say right now in the job market, there's many more people looking to hire qualified people that are going to help them grow their business than workers. And so there's probably never been a better time to like, think about what you want to do, take a chance, like do some work on LinkedIn, figure out what industry you want to be in, look up some companies, send a cold message, right? As long as you're not a, a marketing agency trying to pitch somebody again, right? If you say, Hey, I am a something or other, I, I work at this place. This is going to be, I want to work for your company. There is not a single person out there who's going to be like this, that is just be direct, like shoot. We, the whole world is at everybody's fingertips. So I would use heavily, um, heavily on LinkedIn to build your network, right? Find some mentors, um, right? When we started this, we have advisors uh, that help us out. And so I think that that's the key to our success is going to be just bringing it back to what does that look like? Can we go fast enough? Can we hire the right people, right? I can't do everything. I need to be able to hire people 
who I can trust to do the right thing, to build this business, to wake up every morning and be like, this is so cool. I'm helping people solve this problem streaming. Um, if you could go cure cancer, go cure cancer and don't work for me. Right. Like that's, you know, that's, that's something I'd say there, there are certainly levels of importance of things to do. Um, but at the end of the day, right, we really do believe that we're not only helping make people's lives a little bit better, but by that closing digital divide piece really keeps our team going, um, also to work, to work hard. Uh, so there's one one question here from Stephanie. I see. So do you think cable companies like Comcast or Spectrum will go the way of the dinosaur at some point? Their video bit. The, the interesting thing here, I'll say the one, you have to be nimble as an entrepreneur, right? Things change. I had a vision. We were going to go out and disrupt the cable companies. What ended up happening? Most of the cable companies, they're saying, I don't even want to be in the video business. So instead of disrupting cable companies, we're actually partnering with them and helping them just bridge the gap to this new world. And so, yes, in a way, I don't think they're going to go the way of the dinosaurs because they have a lot of assets in the ground with fiber and, and their cable plant. But every single person is going to see competition. There's going to be competition everywhere. I would say that uh, I wouldn't be a Spectrum or, or uh, Charter as the company or Comcast shareholder. That's, this is off the record. But I would not want to own stock in either of those companies going forward because there's an army of broadband providers that are coming, laying fiber in the ground um, in partnership with my bundle, uh, going after those two companies um, as we speak. And it's only going to get stronger and more fierce over the next five to eight years. Every year, more and more competition which is gonna be great for the consumer. So the good news is consumers are gonna have competition. They're gonna have options. They're gonna have more choice. They're gonna to get to build their own bundle. They're gonna pick their own internet plan. Um, and competition is good. Competition is good for consumers, not great for incumbents, but good for consumers. And I think that that's what I'm really excited um, to, again, to be just a part of. Thanks so much, Jason. I just wanted to say that, you know, there is, I know when it's time to hire, there is a pool of Macaulay students and alums that you can definitely pass the word along. We have a great career um, development team here at Macaulay, so we'll be waiting to hear from you. Um, but such a great conversation on entrepreneurial and your journey, um, and we are wishing you all the best. We're always rooting for you. Johnny, thank you so much for moderating the conversation with Jason tonight. And it's a if, pleasure. If there's anything else, I would just like to say on behalf of Macaulay, thank you both for joining us for this great advice for our students on the entrepreneurial journey. And I'll thank you, thank you, Charmaine and Johnny. It's a lot of fun, and I and I'll just I'll end with if anybody again, Jason Cohn, my bundle on LinkedIn, reach out. Jason at mybundle.tv is my email. Shoot me an email if you have any questions. Always happy to chat. And there is anything I could do for Macaulay. Um, definitely, definitely looking to, to help out as well. So Johnny, thank you very much. You did a great job. So appreciate thank that you. as well. All right. Awesome. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us.